A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. On that day, a shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a bud shall blossom. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and of understanding, a spirit of counsel and of strength, a spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be the fear of the Lord. Not by appearance shall he judge, nor by hearsay shall he decide, but he shall judge the poor with justice and decide a right for the lands afflicted. He shall strike the ruthless with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Justice shall be the band around his waist, and faithfulness a belt upon his hips. Then the wolf shall be the guest of the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the young lion shall browse together with a little child to guide them. The cow and the bear shall be neighbors. Together they shall rest. The lion shall eat hay like the ox. The baby shall play by the cobra's den, and the child lay his hand on the adder's lair. There shall be no harm or ruin on all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be filled with knowledge of the Lord as water covers the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse, set up as a signal for the nations, the Gentiles shall seek out, for his dwelling shall be glorious. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Justice shall flourish in his time, and fullness of peace forever. O God, with your judgment endow the king, and with your justice the king's son. He shall govern your people with justice, and your afflicted ones with judgment. Justice shall flower in his days, and profound peace to the moon be no more. May he rule from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. He shall rescue the poor when he cries out, and the afflicted when he has no one to help him. He shall have pity for the lowly and the poor. The lives of the poor he shall save. May his name be blessed forever. As long as the sun, his name shall remain. In him shall all the tribes of the earth be blessed. All the nations shall proclaim his happiness. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam. Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I give you praise, Father, Lord of heaven and earth 
For although you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned, you have revealed them to the childlike. Yes, Father, such has been your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal him. Turning to the disciples in private, he said, Blessed are your eyes that see what you see. For I say to you, many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Verbum Domini. A number of years ago, I had the joy of traveling to the Holy Land with a group, and in that group was uh, Rhonda Shervin. And Rhonda has come into the faith. She had a Jewish heritage. She grew up in New York City with her twin sister. And although her parents were of Jewish heritage, they were militant atheists. She had a a grandmother who was a devout Christian, but this grandmother was warned that if she ever spoke of God to her or her twin sister, she would never see them again. So they were very staunch in their atheism. So she grew up without any word of God, never learning any prayer, no practice of their Jewish heritage or the feasts or anything like that. But she had, in her autobiography, she relates how a number of incidents, God spoke to her through those incidents. One was when she was in a grade school that this uh, young young Catholic boy came with a surplus and cassock as our servers are dressed here, and he sang a Deste Fidelis to the class which we hear at Christmas time. And she was just caught up in awe and joy. She had never heard sacred music before. And there was something different about this. In junior high, she was uh, to write with all of her classmates what they wanted to be when they grew up. And she wrote one sentence, how can I know what I want to be when I don't even know what the meaning of life is? She got an A plus on that one sentence. So she always had a philosophical bent. And so she studied philosophy. She wanted to know what is truth? What is the meaning of life? What is love? So she studied philosophy with atheist philosophers, but they all seemed very sad and empty. And then one day, Her mother just happened to turn on the television. This was 1958, and there was a Catholic hour with Dietrich and Alice von Hildebrand talking about truth, beauty, goodness, love. And she was captivated by this, and she wrote to them, developed a a rapport with them, and she was caught up by their vitality and their joy. They just seemed to have this vitality about them. They had this this joy that she wanted. And so she started taking classes with them. They were going to go to Europe for the summer and she didn't want to be separated from them so she agreed to travel with them around Europe. But she had a number of experiences there. And one of them was at Chartres Cathedral. I have some pictures here of Chartres Cathedral which is southwest of Paris in France. And it dates back to the 1100s. It was built in the 1100s. And I have a large stained glass window I'll be talking about here that dates back to the year 1145. So 873 years old is this stained glass window. So here's what she said about when she walked into Chart Cathedral. She said, the first miracle came when I saw Chartres Cathedral in France. I looked at the amazing 
shape of that church with the beautiful stained glass windows. And I started to cry. The line from Keats, beauty is truth, truth is beauty, came to mind and I asked myself, how could this be so beautiful if there's no truth to it, just medieval ignorance? Wasn't that you, God of beauty, calling me by name? And she went on to say how the group that she was with went to daily mass and so she started to attend as well. And when she saw her professor kneeling down, she was appalled by that. You are the captain of your soul. You are the master of your faith. You, ne faith. you kneel before no one. But talking with him later about this, she, he came to understand she'd never read the New Testament. So he searched around the stores in France, found an, a Bible in English, a New Testament. And she started reading that on the tour bus, fell asleep, and she sees in a dream, Jesus and Mary sitting. And Mary beckons me and says in Hebrew, come sit with us. I don't know Hebrew, but in the dream I did, she said. Wasn't that you, blessed lady of Zion, calling me by my name? And then she goes on to other experiences that she had with beauty that touched her deeply, as well as the truths of Catholic philosophy and of the faith and the gospel that she was reading that led her to embrace the Catholic faith and eventually to lead her twin sister, her husband, and her mother also to embrace the Catholic faith. And she concludes by saying she's never regretted for one minute being a Catholic. But the reason I wanted to highlight Chart Cathedral today, again, this this ancient cathedral, it was actually the original cathedral. There was a, a, a bishop's seat there since the fourth century. It's a very ancient uh, seat, diocese, bishop, since the fourth century. And this is the most recent of the five structures that were built on that site, known as the Cathedral of Our Lady of Chartres. Again, from the 1100s, including the stained glass windows. But I wanted to highlight, so this is what she saw when she walked in with just the beauty. And there's these large, they would use these large flying buttresses to support the high wall so they could have these longer, uh, narrow uh, walls with uh, stained glass windows, tall stained glass windows. And the stained glass windows really depict saints. It's really a little uh, a vision of the heavenly Jerusalem where the saints are around God, the saints and the angels, and they're depicted in the beauty of the stained glass windows. So the stained glass window here, I have it in its, in its entirety, is the Jesse tree. It's one of the most ancient depictions of the Jesse tree, which comes from the today's first reading from the prophet Isaiah chapter 11. And then here I have two of the panels, the bottom one, and the top one, whether you're zoomed in more so you can see more of the detail. So you can see on the bottom panel is Jesse, referred to in the prophecy of Isaiah 11. And out of him is, is this tree that's growing. And then from Jesse comes King David, of course. He's in the next panel. So Jesse was the father of King David. David was the one who united the 12 tribes of Israel, and he was that unified kingdom. But then after they were taken into captivity, it seemed like all was lost. It was just that tree was cut off. But then Isaiah is going to prophesy that there's going to be this shoot that comes from the stump of Jesse. But here on the Jesse tree, so you see it's coming from King uh, from Jesse, the father of David. Then you have King David, Solomon, who was the son of David, other kings of Israel. And then the sixth panel is the Virgin Mary. And then on the top, of course, is Christ. And you see the seven doves, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit that Isaiah also prophesied in this prophecy that we heard today. 
And then on either side are prophets. So the prophets were those who foretold the coming of Christ, the fulfillment of all the longings of the people. And what is the, uh, the Old Testament book that both Catholic liturgy and Jewish liturgy, liturgy reads from the most? What is the Old Testament book that is read from the most, that we hear most in the liturgy, in both Jewish liturgy and Catholic liturgy? Well, number one is the Psalms, right? We hear the Psalms every day. We sing the Psalms, we pray them in the divine office. Number two is the prophet Isaiah. And so especially during the season of Advent, we're hearing from the prophet Isaiah. He has sometimes been called the fifth gospel because there's so many prophets, prophecies that are fulfilled in Christ. And right now we're reading uh, from, from Isaiah 7 to Isaiah 11 is called the book of Emmanuel. So Isaiah 7, the virgin shall be with child and he shall be called Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, he will be called the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. He will sit on the throne of his father, David. And then Isaiah 11, that we had today. On that day, a shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots, a bud shall blossom. And what was the, the line that the church highlighted in today's gospel? Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. That was the first line we heard in today's gospel. Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. And so what does Isaiah prophesy of this shoot that's going to come, that's gonna bring about this new king, this new king that's going to arise, this new kingdom? What does Jesus do? He brings 12 apostles, symbolic of the 12 tribes that were united under David. But what about this one who's going to spring from Jesse, this new king, this restoration of the kingdom? The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and of strength, a spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be the fear of the Lord, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we see that depicted in this top window, this prophecy of Isaiah. In fact, what Isaiah is prophesying is that there's going to be a new king. We heard this in today's first reading, Isaiah 11. There's going to be a new king and kingdom. There's going to be a new creation. And there's going to be a new exodus. So what happened at the fall? Our first parents were driven out of Eden. But what's going to happen? There's going to be this restoration where that peace that was there before the fall is going to be restored. And so the wolf's going to be the guest of the lamb, the leopard and the kid. There's going to be this peace even among all of the creatures that are now antagonistic or you know, after one another, that there's going to be this restoration. And so how, why do we see that often in beautiful church architecture? And you see it in the windows here. You see flowers. God wanted flowers and vegetables and those things depicted in the Old Testament temple. And so we see that often in church architecture too because it's talking about that restoration of creation, this, this new earth, this new peace that's going to be brought about, this, this new life that's going to come about. So Isaiah prophesies this new king and kingdom, there's going to be this new creation and there's going to be a new Exodus. So the first Exodus, they left Egypt, they were liberated from Pharaoh and his armies, and they came to the promised land. But this new Exodus, and we heard the first part of it in today's first reading, on that day the root of Jesse set up as a signal for the nations the Gentiles shall seek out for his dwelling shall be glorious. So it's not only the Jewish people that are gonna be brought now, are gonna be restored, are gonna be taken from their exile, a new exodus.
But even the Gentiles too, they're going to seek him out. They're going to find glory in him. Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II, in a letter that he wrote to artists, he said this, <clears throat> the church needs art. He said, in order to communicate the message entrusted to her by Christ, the church needs art. Art must make perceptible and as far as possible attractive the world of the spirit, the invisible of God. It must therefore translate into meaningful terms that which is in itself ineffable. We can't put words to it, but we try to portray it in art and music and architecture, the things of the spirit. And he continued, art has a unique capacity to take one or other facet of the message and translate it into colors, shapes, and sounds which nourish the intuition of those who look or listen. So Rhonda walks into Chartres Cathedral and she just senses the beauty of God with the light and the color and the saints and Christ portrayed in the beauty. And then just a final quote I'd like to give you that from that, the beauty that saves, and he quotes Dostoevsky's beauty will save the world. He said, beauty is a key to the mystery and a call to transcendence. It is an invitation to savor life and to dream of the future. So beauty keeps us from despairing. When we encounter the beauty, like the beauty of an architecture, the architecture of Chartres, or the beauty of the arts of the windows or other beauty, or the beauty of sacred music, it's we're like, we're caught up in the transcendence, something more, something bigger. God himself was the source of all beauty, truth, and goodness. <clears throat> and lastly, I just conclude with a, a note that I received from a viewer yesterday regarding the sacred music that I've talked about in the past and the use of it that we've expanded at the daily mass. Father Joseph, when you first gave a talk on sacred music, I was prepared to write it off. However, I've come to respect and love sacred music. It lifts my soul to heights of calm and thoughts of God. My soul loves the sanctity I feel. I can't seem to put my thoughts into better words. Thank you so much. Mass has taken on new life with that music. That's what the sacred does. That's what beauty does. It helps us to have a little foretaste of that heavenly Jerusalem where the saints are in glory with the Lord forever. The Jesse tree, and I encourage that devotion for families where you have different ornaments that talk about the different events of salvation history and the ancestry of Jesus who came in time and history to unite himself with humanity to lead us to glory.